This image from space, from the space shuttle, shows what uh, the, the uh, astronauts have taught us. Just as Galileo's telescope revealed uh, the true relationship of the Earth to the sun, the, the sky is shockingly thin. And as the late Carl Sagan used to say, it's similar to a thin coat of varnish on a medium-sized globe. And even though the Earth is large, the sky is very small in comparison. And for a variety of reasons, we are now capable of having a great impact on it. The entire relationship between the human species and our home planet has been radically altered by the quadrupling of population in less than a, in a century, by, much more importantly, by the magnified power available to each individual that science and technology has given us, and by our obsession with short-term thinking, whether uh, in business being focused on quarterly reports or politicians on overnight public opinion polls or media empires on weekly sweeps weeks, and the neuroscientists have uh, explanations for our preference to short-term horizons, but we have a generational challenge now. And all of you know this basic science well, the, the energy from the sun comes through the atmosphere as a short-wave light uh, and is absorbed by the planet and is re-radiated as infrared, and some of the outgoing infrared is trapped, and that's a good thing. Another of the anniversaries, and I referred to it, is that this is the 150th anniversary of Sir John Tyndall's discovery that CO2 molecules absorb infrared radiation. That, I'm told by scientists, is not controversial. It is rather like gravity. <laughs> it's quite well established. And Here's a way of looking at its significance. Earth and Venus are almost exactly the same size, no more than 400 kilometers difference in their circumference. Less well known is that they have almost exactly the same amount of carbon. But the miracle of life and the unique geological forces here on Earth have over billions of years removed much of the carbon from the atmosphere, leaving that ideal thin shell ideal in that it's perfect for the evolution of life and for the sustenance of us. Uh, but on Venus, those processes did not occur, so most of, the atmosphere, most of the carbon is still in the atmosphere. What difference does that make? Well, on Earth, the temperature is 59 degrees, or 15 Celsius, and on Venus, it's 855 <laughs> degrees, or 475 Celsius, and it rains sulfuric acid. So however uh, upset you were at the weather forecast this morning, it wasn't that. Uh, and, and it really it doesn't matter that Venus, very much that Venus is closer to the sun. It's three times hotter than Mercury, which is right next to the sun. Indeed, all that CO2 is much more reflective than Earth's atmosphere. It has less coming in, but much more trapped. So this is relevant to human civilization's current global strategy of taking as much carbon as possible as quickly as we can out of the ground and putting it in the atmosphere. As we do so, this thin line thickens. And as it thickens, more of the infrared is trapped. And that's why the change in annual global temperatures uh, is so pronounced. And by the way, that's below that line. And uh, to go back one, you would expect that above that line, it might be getting cooler. So here is CSI climate above the line. It is indeed getting cooler. The 10 hot, 10 the 10 hottest years in the atmospheric record, going back only 160 years, have been in the last 11 years. Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about the North Polar Ice Cap. It is the single most vulnerable 
load-bearing element of the current ecological balance in the Earth's climate system. In 1980, it looked like this, and last year, uh, 14 months ago, it looked like this. But I want to go beyond just the surface area of the Arctic and look at the thickness of the Arctic. The Navy submarines have been patrolling under the Arctic, and uh, with those measures and others, uh, we have now uh, seen the truth the scientific community has been putting out that there's a positive feedback loop. Most of the sun's rays bounce off the ice, and as the ice melts, as in the right-hand part of that image, instead of 90% or so of the sun's rays being reflected, 90% or so are, are absorbed, and the heat builds up. So in 2005, a new record loss of ice was measured, which is equivalent to every state east of the Mississippi River. For most of the last three million years, I'm told, the area covered by the Arctic ice cap has been roughly equivalent to the lower 48 states minus an area roughly equal to Arizona. I'm not singling out Arizona. This, <laughs> this graph wasn't made during the recent general election campaign. Uh, but uh, the scientists that I met with at the National Snow and Ice Data Center were truly shocked uh, when in 2007, in one year, it, to use their phrase, uh, fell off a cliff. Uh, and again, to put this in perspective, that would mean another whole row and a half of states west of the Mississippi River. This is happening quickly, and it is picking up speed. But now to the, uh, the depth of the ice. You could say that the uh, Arctic ice cap is, in a sense, a beating heart for the ocean and climate system. In the winter, it expands. In the summer, it contracts, as seen of this, in this uh, cardiothermogram of a real human heart. What I'm going to show you next measures the thickness of the ice with the permanent ice marked in red over a 30-year period. Again, the dark blue is when the winter ice expands. The so-called permanent ice, five years old or older, is much thicker and you can see what's happening to it over time. It's diminishing fairly rapidly. And that's the ice that survives from one year to the next. And when that's gone, you can see it spilling out along the east coast of Greenland, almost like blood from a body. It was here, and now it's here. Dr. Vashlev Maslowski at the Naval Postgraduate School has said, has calculated uh, that in his view there is an 80% chance it will be completely gone during the summer months in five years. It can come back, uh, but not if we allow the continued and rapid buildup of heat uh, at depth in the Arctic Ocean. When this giant mirror, uh, if you will, is replaced by the absorption of heat in the Arctic Ocean, it has a number of consequences, and I'm only going to mention two of them briefly. Uh, of course, everybody has heard about the, the polar bears, and I'm not going to dwell on that. But the area around the Arctic Ocean uh, has a lot of frozen carbon in the ground. And as that permafrost thaws, it has the potential for being turned by microbes into methane, which later breaks down into CO2, uh, the total amount already in the atmosphere could double during uh, the time uh, when this methane was released uh, if it is released. 